I'm going to say it again. <laughs> there was a word of the Lord here and you did not let it go. That means you robbed me and everybody else in here because you're insecurities. Come on, someone say amen. amen. You all know, you all mature enough in God to know when the Spirit of the Lord is on you. Amen. I'll leave it at that. Turn around, bless somebody. Welcome them to the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. See, we come gathered together to hear from God. We come gathered together to be inspired. Amen. You could have been that vessel today that God wanted to use to inspire somebody. Amen. So I'm glad we're here today. You know, I pray that everybody's doing well in the midst of all the madness. Amen. You know, now they, they have a vaccine. And thank God for the vaccine that came out to cure, to fix a cure of a disease that 98 or yeah, 98.4% of the people recover from it. So that little small percentage is going to be helped because of that. Now they're saying, if you get the shot, act like you can still be infected. Act like you're still infected. Wear your mask, stay home, and social distance. It's all madness. It's all madness, man. And it's driving people bonkers, man. It's, you know, we got family members that aren't even getting together for Christmas, which has been traditional throughout year after year after year because of this. And I seen a guy the other day on, on, on YouTube. He hadn't seen his mother in months, and he, put a, uh, and he wanted a hug from his mother. So he put himself in a big plastic bag to give her a hug. It's sad what's happening. In San Francisco, overdose deaths are out distancing COVID deaths. Amen. Our young teenagers are committing suicide. Because of the foolishness that we are allowed to go on. I say we've allowed to go on. I don't use this pulpit as a political platform, but I'm sick of this mess. Amen. Amen. There's a recall for Gavin Newsom. And if you feel, you know, if you have any desire for your freedom at all, you need to get online and you need to sign that recall. Get him out of office so that we can get our freedoms back. Amen. And, and, and you know, I, I apologize to myself for doing this because I do not use the pulpit as a political position, but when the politics are coming against my Christian principles, I'm fighting back. I mean, understand what I'm talking about. Amen. And so um, we're going to get into the word. Amen. This is our 11th week of a series called Your Habits Kill Your Dreams and Your Destiny. How many have found yourself to be a slave to your habits? I've been reading this book, The Power of Habit, and it's an awesome book. And, I, uh, and in reading it, I'm finding out how corporations manipulate things in the stores and themes to get us to change our habits to buy differently than we would normally buy. And you know what? We are very, 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 uh, uh, what do you call that? I easily influenced people. If you don't rely on the Holy Spirit, my God, you're going to be influenced by every form of righteousness, unrighteousness. You're going to be influenced by everything that the political, uh, political parties and the government puts down our throat today. You need to get a hold of God. If you don't get a hold of God now, you're going to lose it. A lot of these people that close their churches, they're losing it. A lot of Christians quit going to churches, they're losing it. I'm not trying to make friends. I'm trying to declare the word of God. You know, I've always wanted to say, God, I want to be one of those preachers where everybody likes me. Then you ain't a preacher. You ain't a preacher. Now, I'm going to get some of you all mad right now, and some of them mad watching me. The Bible says in the last days, God will shake up everything that can be shaken. Wall Street's being shaken up. Amen. Our political parties are being shaken up, man. Things are being exposed, never been exposed. The churches have been shaken up. Amen. And, you know, I've been wondering, well, God, why, 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 why? Why are all these religious leaders that we look up to are not opening their doors and not even speaking out and saying nothing? I'm going to tell you why. So my Bible tells me God called me. He called me to lift up my voice and make it loud. Cry out against this kind of stuff because your salvation, my salvation, other people's salvation is at stake. And if our religious leaders are acting a certain way, guess what way we're going to follow? We're going to follow that. Amen. What's his name? Joel Osteen. Church is closed. He received four and a half million dollars for the payroll protection. So it's easy to stay home and do nothing to get four and a half million dollars while the sheep are being scattered. 
The sheep are being hurt. The sheep are being uh, misled. The sheep are being destroyed. He's not the only one. But he got the largest sum. And you know what this does? This opens up the door for the government to come in, sanction the church. We're living in a time that we need to protect our faith. Amen. And we've said this forever and ever and ever since I've been saved. But you know what? The stuff that has happened in communist countries against the churches of Jesus Christ can happen right here. And the foundation is being laid right now. If there's ever a time for you to fight for your right to be at church, it's now. Oh, get me wrong. Don't prove nothing by trying to come to church. Amen. If your faith ain't there, stay home. If, you're, if, you're, uh, if your uh, uh, immune system is compromised, stay home. If you're living with somebody whose immune system is compromised, stay home. Wear a mask. Do whatever you got to do. But don't come to try to prove something. Do it because you know it's your duty and your right to stand up and protect our religious freedoms. Amen. Not only are religious freedoms being attacked, but so is everything else. I'm gonna, I don't want to go on a tangent. So let's get into the word. Amen. Your unfulfilled dreams and aspirations have not come to fruition not because, not because of bad luck, but because of habits. Habits that you developed. And unless you develop habits that are in line with your dreams and aspirations, those dreams and aspirations will never come to completion. Our habits will create or destroy. And we don't think that much about our habits because we don't think about, we don't think about habits. We just do it naturally without thinking. Our habits develop on a subconscious level. The habits that you have formulated today create your victory or your success tomorrow. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and all of a sudden, you know, your life be peaches and cream. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and all of a sudden everything's in line. All your ducks in a row and your ship has come in and, you know, kumbaya. That ain't going to happen. You have to set habits in your life today to make that become a reality tomorrow. How many of, don't raise your hand, because it's just a rhetorical question. Uh, How many of us have have lived our life always wanting something better, but not changing anything to make it better? See, nobody taught me and told me how uh, um, how, how to have goals. Nobody taught me how to do that. So I live my life with no goals, existing from day to day. Am I talking to anybody? Just accepting what comes by. If I can just endure this, I'll be okay. Life is more than enduring. Life is to be enjoyed. I don't care if you've been divorced 10 times, you've got 20 kids. It doesn't matter. It's still to be enjoyed. I don't mean I don't care. I feel sorry that you had to go through all that. But life is to be enjoyed. But see, we get stuck, we get stuck in the misery of our life. We don't get past that. We don't get past that. We don't have any goals or dreams to get past that. So, and so we're always looking and wondering, gee, they're blessed and they're blessed and they're blessed. Well, they've done something to get blessed. You can't keep living the same way you're living, expecting something different to happen. If, amen. If you ain't changed nothing, tomorrow's going to be your today. And to your today is, was your yesterday. And your yesterday was last year. Amen. I don't like living like that. I want to make habits in my life that make my future brighter than my present. You want a brighter future? It comes with your habit. Turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6. I say the habit on a subconscious level, they will promote success or failure. Subconscious level means you just do it. You just do it without thinking about it. When I come to to the office, I go in my office, I open up my Bible, open up my computer, I start studying. I don't have to think about it. That's the first thing I do before I do anything else. Then I pray. I don't have to think about it. Look, okay, it's time to pray. There's something in me that says, okay, this is my habit, and I do it. What do you have a habit of doing? Do you have a habit of watching television? Over and over and over and over and over? Binge watching television? Do you have a habit of living in pleasure over and over and over? Pleasure is good, but too much pleasure ain't no good for you. It's like giving your kids sugar and candy all day long. They're going to get sick of it sooner or later, and it's going to affect them physically. Living living in pleasure forever and ever and ever is going to destroy you spiritually, because you're never going to grow. Habits that you create dictate your victory or your success tomorrow. The Bible tells us in the book of Daniel about King Darius that set out a decree that if anybody bowed down to anything other than the statue that he created, 
that they were going to be killed. And he sealed it. He was tricked to do this. And the Bible says, look at this. This blew my mind when I read this. This man was operating out of habit. You see, when you got a habit, you can't help but do it. How many follow what I'm talking about? You got a habit of driving home a certain way? Every single day? And you ever tell yourself, I'm going to go a different way? And what'd you do? Went back the same way. Because a habit is conditioned behavior. Conditioned behavior, the only way conditioned behavior can change is if you consciously make a decision. And when this decree was made, it, it was made to make Daniel consciously make a decision. He's seen the statue. He knew the writing. And he had to consciously make a decision. Should I follow that mandate that they made or I should follow my habit? He chose to follow his habit without reservation. And let's read this in, in, in Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he knew the consequences for following a habit. He knew that it was signed. That, doesn't mean he, that, that, that means he knew what the consequences of signing that document was. So he was faithful to his God because he was faithful to his God. For no other reason. He was just faithful to his God because that was his habit. See, many of us, we're not faithful to God because that's not our habit. We're faithful to our TV. Amen. What's your favorite program? Come on. Mine swamp people. <laughs> January, I know what time it is. I know when, and I'm there even though it's recorded. I'm watching it live, and I can watch it again without commercials when it's done. My wife says, why do you see in that it's the same alligator? No, it's not. <laughs> They're different. <laughs> now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he went into the house. Now in his roof chamber, in his windows were open toward Jerusalem. He continued to get on his knees three times daily, praying as giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. We come to church even though a document has been signed because we have been doing this previously. A signature does not tell us we cannot come to church. A signature did not tell Daniel that he could not pray because it had become a habit of his and he knew the value of that habit. So many of us, we want the blessings of God. We want God's protection. We want God's financial blessings. We want the peace of God when we need it, but we don't do anything to get it before we need it. So what happens when you need it, you can't get it because you don't know how to obtain it. See, you obtain what you need before you need it so that when you, get, when you need it, you draw it out of yourself. You're not hearing what I'm saying. Everything that you need in your life, everything that you need mentally, physically, spiritually, financially, health is locked up inside of you. And you need to make habits to make it come alive out of you. Jesus said, it's necessary that I go away. If I don't go away, the whole comforter can't come to you. And when he comes to you, he will, go, he will reside in you, and he will lead you, and he will guide you. The Holy Spirit within you will lead you and guide you when you have made a habit of doing what you're supposed to be doing before you need what you need. Amen. Study to show yourself approved unto God when you're in trouble. Study to show yourself approved unto God when you're in a financial situation. No, it's a study. So that when the, when the problems come, you already know what to do. You could draw it out of you. It becomes a habit. We, see, how many of us don't have a habit of studying? Don't have a habit of reading? Don't have a habit of praying? But we got a habit of eating? We got a habit of watching TV? We got a habit of going on vacations? Every four weeks, bam, we're gone. I didn't mean nothing. <laughs> Daniel knew that his habits would bring him his victory. That meant he also knew his habits would, could bring him his defeat. See, we have not drawn a correlation between habits and victory. When you are doing what God called you to do, victory is assured. When you're not doing, when you don't have the habits of doing what God's called you to do, 
we're not assured. I was reading, uh, somebody had posted something about, uh, uh, they wanted prayer. And in their prayer, they said, please, Lord Jesus, hear me. And I think, now that's somebody that doesn't have a habit of being with the Father. Because my Bible doesn't say plead. My Bible doesn't say beg. My Bible says ask. How much follow what I'm talking about? And somebody that has a habit of ha- keeping a relationship with the Father understands that. And what happens when you start pleading and you start begging, so Father, please, I ask this in Jesus' name, please, please, please. You're not operating in faith. And you can't operate in faith when you need it when you're not built it up before you needed it. You have to, have, it, have to have a habit of building yourself up in the faith before you need it. See, our problem is we don't want to, we don't call on God and we don't build up our habits until there's an emergency. Then we see the necessity of having God as Lord and Savior. He has to be a necessity of your being Lord and Savior of your life before you, you see, he was Lord, he became a necessity because of where I came from. He pulled me out of there and I realized the value of letting him be my Lord. He keeps me from that. So I want to nurture my relationship so I don't return to that. And the benefit of nurturing that relationship so I don't return to that, I have strength for the future. Well, let's read this in verse, uh, um, uh, go to verse um, 16. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is it 16 or, no, I'm sorry, 22. So they throw Daniel in the lion's den. King Darius is fasting and praying all night long. And he comes down in the morning, he bangs on the rock. He says, Daniel, are you there? And listen to, listen to his response. And, uh, and show what the power of a habit is. Not any habit, but your habit. There's power in your habit. If we understand that, we'll cultivate that. If you have a habit of prayer, you become a strong prayer warrior. If you have a habit of reading the word, you become strong in the word. If you have a habit of staying in communion with the Father, you have a strong relationship with him. The reason why we don't have those things is because we don't have those habits. It's so easy for me to fellowship with somebody because I can see them. You can have fellowship with the Father even though you don't see him. I get goosebumps driving my car because the Holy Spirit comes in. See, we are convinced that there is a God. We're convinced there's a Savior. But we're not converted enough to change our habits. You'll surrender your habits of addiction, of loose living, to come in to get a habit of talking and acting and looking like a Christian before we get in the habit of being one. Well, not trying to make enemies here this morning. Listen to his response. My God has sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions so that they have, no, they have not hurt me. Because I was found in him innocent before him and also before you, O king, I have committed no crime. Then the king was greatly pleased and ordered that Daniel was taken out of the den. So Daniel was taken out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed and he relied on and he trusted in his God. I've read that 10,000 times. When did he rely on? When did he trust? And when did he have confidence in his God? Not when he was in the lion's den. When he knew the decree was signed, he says, I'm not concerned about that because I'm serving a living God and I trust him that he will keep me no matter what they say. For years I preached that it was his faith going in the lion's den. It was his faith in the lion. It wasn't his faith in the lion's den. It was his faith and, and his actions before the lion's den. It's your habits before the problems come. And listen to this. He says that there was no harm upon him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the Bible says that there was not even a hint of smoke on them. And they didn't have confidence in God in the fire. They had confidence in their, their habit was before, before they went in the fire, their habit was to trust God. They had a resolution in their spirit that they were not going to bow down to anything else. Listen to me. They had a resolution in their spirit they were not going to bow down. In unison they said, let this be known unto thee, O king, that if you change your mind, we are not going to bow down. 
the preachers and the pastors of today do not have a resolution of not bowing down to anything else. They bow down to every whim that the government will give to them, and they're surrendering their authority. These men did not surrender authority. They went through the fire, and the fire was not even on them. And in the midst of the fire, the angel, the Spirit of the Lord, was in there with them, keeping them the same way they kept Daniel. It's because of their habit before they went in there. You can't cry on God when you need God, when you ain't cried on him, when you did not need him. Let me break it down. How many got that one friend that ain't your friend until they need something? <laughs> Amen. You see them all around town. You see them doing this thing and that thing and the other thing. And they call you when they need $20. Yeah. How many times do you give them that $20 and says, oh, now you need me? Now you want me? We don't want that done to us. Then why do we do it to God? Why do we only open up the door into fellowship with him when we need something. Because we have a habit of been doing that. There's not only those personal habits, but there's also generational habits. You have been experiencing generational habits without even realizing it. You see, I shared the story about a little black dog we had named Willie. And my kids were all excited playing with it. and It bothered me. Because I was watching TV. You know how kids make noise? <laughs> it bothered me. So I got up, I snatched that little dog, and I said, you guys, go to your room. But I said, just, you get in your room, you go in your room, and I threw the dog outside. What we do? I said, just shut up. I went back to watching my TV. And something come on me. God, why did I do that? And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He says, because you were never allowed to have fun in the house. So you're perpetuating the same habits. Hello? You ever come to that place where you realize, oh my God, I became my mother? Oh my God, I became my father? It was a habit that was taught to you. And without thinking it, without thinking about it, you're giving into it and you are taking ownership of that habit. And that habit is destroying you spiritually and it's destroying your relationships. Go over to Acts chapter 7. And we'll see how these generational habits keep people from understanding the word of God. You come from a household that was resistant to God and you never did get that fixed in your spirit. You're still resistant to God until you get that fixed in your spirit. Stephen was having a conversation, he was telling the religious leaders. He wasn't telling street folk, he was telling religious leaders, people that know the word. And he was telling them about Jesus the Messiah and how they had crucified him. And he was telling them, he says, this ain't just your fault. You learned this from your fathers and their fathers. It was a generational habit. You got a habit of snapping at your children? Come on without realizing you're snapping at them? Do you pick them up by their arm and like they're a rag doll? It was, I guarantee it was done to you. I guarantee it. And it was a habit that you're not breaking, that you're carrying into your children, and you're teaching them that same habit. Hurt people, hurt pe people. Abuse people, abuse people. Heal people, heal people. We ain't got enough healed people to do the work of God in here. Because our habits are controlling our minds, our habits are controlling our actions, our habits are controlling our behavior, and we do it without thinking about it. Today, anytime I take an action and I see that in the face of somebody that it was not that reaction I wanted to get from them, I consider, what was my, what was my habit? Where'd that come from? Why did I act like that? Why did I say that? Oh my God. It's because I was surrounded by that behavior 98% of my life. And it started becoming a part of me. Habits are very influential. You ever have your teenage friend or your teenage child or daughter go over to somebody's house that really wasn't right? You didn't want them going over there? How'd they come back? Acting just like them. Acting just like them. That's what habits do. Habits look for somebody that just jumps on them and controls them. And we embrace it thinking we're in charge. 
I realized with the um, understanding of psychology and the uh, uh, influx of uh, uh, media and technology, we are puppets. We are puppets. They're creating habits that we, you know, we don't realize they're, they're creating these habits. They play certain music. They do put, place things in stores for specific reasons because they understand our psychology and they could trick us into buying things we really don't need and becomes a habit. I can't tell how many times I walked in the store. I didn't need this thing, but I had to have it. Why did I have to have it? Because I seen a commercial. Big Macs. I don't like Big Macs. I don't even go to McDonald's. But a Big Mac commercial makes me want to have a Big Mac cheeseburger. And if I give in to that enough times, they have formulated my habit. See, we can understand habits when it's negative. When we see negative uh, 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 repercussions for it. But there doesn't always have to be a, 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 a visual negative repercussion. The greatest repercussion of our habits that keeps us from the blessings and the promises of God. That's why there's so many dissatisfied believers and pastors and preachers that are unfulfilled inside. It's not because of what they're doing. It's because of what they're not doing. They're not overcoming their habits. They're not allowing the Holy Spirit to expose those habits that are keeping them from the promises of God. It's not what's outside of you that's destroying you. It's what's inside of you that's destroying you that you justify your behavior with. I could have justified, I'm trying to watch my TV. These kids should understand that and they should be quiet. No, I was perpetuating a dominant attitude that my mother had that I picked up and put it on my children. Ooh, you're a monster. Not no more, I'm not. Acts 7.51, let's read. You stubborn and stiff-necked people, still heathen, uncircumcised. Now he's talking to religious leaders. Can you imagine what happened? He was talking to pastors. Pastors conference. I want to talk to all you stubborn, stiff-necked and stubborn pastors here this morning. They'll pick up and walk, carry their Bibles and go someplace else and go against you. And this man was speaking truth. And I think the truth be being known, he'd probably be talking to each and every one of us today. Stubborn, stiff-necked and heathen and uncircumcised in your heart and your ears. You are always actively resisting the Holy Spirit. What? As your forefathers. He's talking to religious leaders who are children of religious leaders. They were, they were the Sanhedrin council. They were Levites. These were priests. They were leaders of the law. So they were raised that way, and he said, you, your father, your grandfather, so forth and so on, resisted the work of the Holy Spirit, and you're doing it too because you put all your attention on the rules and the regulations rather than what the Holy Spirit's doing. How many pastors are doing that today? This is what the organization says, this is what our bylaws say, but what's the Holy Spirit say? You are always actively resisting the Holy Spirit as your far forefathers were. So you are and so you do. You are mimicking, you are parroting, you are acting just like them because you are a part of them now. Whether you like it or not, all those traits you did not like about your parents that were negative are in you and you're more than likely carrying it in your children or your grandchildren. Hallelujah. Shut up because I said so. What do you think God gave your child a mouth for? You're disrespecting me. Oh, that's a good one. A child does not know disrespect. They're taught disrespect. And they're taught disrespect because that bad attitude that you have disrespects them. So they care. Oh, I don't, that's my child. I don't have to. You, got to dis, you got to respect your children. They have an opinion. They have a mind. They have a will. And you're supposed to form it so they're better than you. So I was raised this way, as most people in here. Do as I say. What? Not as I, Not as I it never worked. <laughs> Kids are to what? Be seen and not heard. That never worked. And you may not use those words. 
but how much attention are you giving to your toddler when they're running their mouth and saying nothing? Amen. My youngest daughter, man, one time she's in the car and she's, every day after school, I pick her up and how's your day, blah, 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 you right? And one day it was just routine. And she, a little motor mouth, she wouldn't stop. My mind's somewhere else. And she goes, you ain't even listening to me. Look, I go, yeah, yeah, well, tell me what I said. I don't need to tell you what I said, what you said. I know, you know what you said. <laughs> but I checked out. Because nobody listened to me. You know what I'm saying? These are things that we need to become consciously aware of if you want to be the person God wants you to be. It's not about just passing out flyers. It's not about just filling up the church. If you become who you're supposed to be, you don't have to do all the other stuff because you become a light that you're supposed to be and people want to flock to you. Amen. You see, there's something about a light that draws. You go in the wilderness, you put a light on your porch, all the animals want to come see what that light is. Back, turn your light on in the summertime. See what happens. All the moths, all the mosquitoes, everything is drawn to it. Why aren't people drawn to us? It's supposed to be children of light? Because we're still walking in darkness. We're still walking in darkness thinking that, thinking that, that we got something because we could make biblical proclamations. Which of the prophets did your forefathers not persecute? And they who slew those were pro proclaimed beforehand. The coming of the righteous one whom you have portrayed and murdered. Something about the truth that will make you become angry. Right. Yeah. True. See, so I, I could sense it here so right now. Some of you say, oh, God, who do they think he is? But since somebody pinpoints something about your life, we get defensive rather than thanking God for exposing us to us so that we could be free from it. Right. Again, where'd you learn that? You have received the law and it was ordained and set in order and delivered by angels and yet you did not obey it. You will get, go ballistic when somebody exposes the truth to you unless you're sincerely seeking direction from God. That stubborn habit, that resistant habit makes you shut down every time. Don't raise your hands, but how many times you get angry during a message? And that blows my mind. How are you going to get mad at church over the preacher? I don't know your business. I don't want to know your business. I don't question nobody about you. I don't even want you coming to me telling me your business because I have freedom to preach that way. Let yeah. I me mean, follow what I'm saying. I could preach about anything because I don't know nothing Amen. about you. So when the Holy Spirit starts pinpointing something, we get mad. Well, Who does he think he is talking to me like that? He's got a camera. He's got a, a, a microphone in my house. I know it. No, the Holy Spirit's been reading your mail, but you're so stubbornly resistant out of habit. Listen, stubbornly resistant out of habit. Can we help somebody? How many have had stubborn parents? How many have dealt with your stubbornness since then? No, we just put it under the rug. We don't deal with it. We don't deal with it. We put it under the rug. We learn some scriptures and we think it's okay. No, when that stubbornness rises up, we say, oh, no, you ain't. You get down there. That's dealing with it. And I've been dealing with mine for a long time, and that sucker rises all the time. Amen. Sometimes I just get tired. I say, you know what? Come on. They deserve it. Let it out. <laughs> and then I pay the consequences for it. <laughs> Amen. Now listen to this. Now upon hearing these things, the Jews, they were cut to the heart and infuriated. Why? because the truth penetrated them. They were cut to the heart, and I moved my church membership. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that would have, I'll show him, that's right. Because we can't handle the truth. And we, we can't handle the truth, listen to me, not because you can't handle the truth, but nobody showed you how to handle the truth. Amen. My daughter's in Colorado, and I work constantly with her. I call her all the time trying to help her through transitioning from being a teenager to a responsible adult. 
That means I have to call her sometimes, ask her, how you doing, baby? What you experience today? Okay, you have to learn how to handle this because you're, this is what's going to happen in the real world. You're out there now by yourself. You need to learn to deal with it. Right. Nobody ever done that to me. Right. Nobody ever done that to me. So I had to learn through, uh, 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 through, through my emotions yeah. right. getting a hold of me and me destroying things and destroying people. We are supposed to, supposed, not supposed, supposed to instruct. But we don't because nobody had a habit of instructing us. The Western world is a strange world. And it's getting stranger. Don't raise your hands, but how many of you said, I can't wait until my kid's 18 and they're gone. Is 18 a magic number where all of a sudden they can handle life? No, it's not. We're supposed, but we don't do it because nobody had a habit of that for us. So we got ours, they got to get theirs. No, you got to help them get theirs. Amen. Amen. When somebody pinpoints this truth to us, we get angry. Well, you just don't know how disrespectful and rude that they are. No, I see how irresponsible you are. They gnashed their teeth and they cut at him and they destroyed him. They killed him because they could not handle the truth. See, today this is happening in the churches because people cannot handle the truth. They will character assassinate a pastor. They will character and assassinate a church because they couldn't handle the truth in that church. Because they have a habit of doing that. And other people have a habit of listening to it and perpetuating it. We're living in a time where God is exposing the church for what it has been so that it become what it's supposed to be because we are far from where, where God wants us to be at, my friend. You cannot change your habits by quoting scriptures. He was talking to religious leaders. They knew the, Sa- the Sanhedrin council, the Pharisees, they, the Levites. They knew the scriptures. The Levites would wear scriptures on their, on their robes. They'd wear them in their hats and, and, and in their sleeves. So they knew the scriptures. They quoted the scriptures. How many of us have changed, tried to change our circumstances by quoting the scriptures? The scripture alone can do you no nothing. Nothing. But the way it's sold today, the scriptures are like a magic mantra. 500 scriptures for prosperity. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you bought those little booklets? 500 scriptures to quote for peace. I don't have to quote anything for peace. Jesus said, my peace I give to you. His peace is already within me. I just got to get rid of the war that is fighting against the peace. How do we follow that? And I am the war that's fighting against the peace because I'm non-compliant. I don't want to comply with what God says. Got to forgive you. Got to honor you. Got to trust you. Got to love you. I don't even know you. My flesh don't want to comply to that. So there's a war going on in there, and I realize, wait a minute, there's a greater law, the law of God. So I'm going to bring my flesh under subjection, and I have a habit of disliking people. Now I'm going to have a habit of liking people because I see the benefit to it. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, is is like like a storm inside of me, a quiet storm. I don't have to quote all these scriptures to get it. Can we help somebody again? How many of y'all in here, by a show of hands, have quoted scripture and quoted scripture and quoted scripture and tried to obtain it by quoting the scripture? And it didn't work? What happened? God don't love me. I'm different. I'm a freak. And it added to everything you thought about yourself before. So you walk around, feel alienated in the church. The Bible says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, but it's only quick and powerful. It's only alive on lips of faith. Not somebody thinking that they can get something by a magic mantra. A mantra is something that is going to happen because you repeat it 500 times. You could tell yourself, you could put, park your, put your head in the oven and say, I'm a biscuit, I'm a biscuit, I'm a biscuit. You're always going to be human. You're never going to be a biscuit. You're never going to be a car. Amen. So I'm confident, I'm bold, I'm assured. You're never going to be that until it comes alive in you. You can quote it all you want to. 
Amen. I've seen people, man, they got broken arms. They say, oh, you got broken No, I'm healed. Don't look like it. You got a cast. I'm healed. Misrepresentation of the word of God, and it makes the rest of us look like fools. And then we got to deal with it. You got a broken, yes, I got a broken arm, but God's healing it. Wait a minute. God put a natural process of healing, so this is nothing I even need to call on God for. It's a natural process of healing when the two bones are put back together again. So I need to call upon God. It's something that's out of my control. See, out of habit, because the church has done it, we want to put God in the natural order of things. I mean, God, I need finances. Get a job. Amen. God, I need a financial blessing. Get a job. I need some help financially. Get a job. I need extra money. Work extra. Amen. It is so easy to make money today. You can go to Target and you can buy lots and lots of stuff there. I don't mean lots and lots. I mean lo- in lots. How many follow I'm talking about? A lot. Bulk. <laughs> you can buy bulk and turn around and put it on eBay, sell it for twice the amount. People are doing that. They're getting rich doing it. They broke a habit of expecting everybody to give them something. You can go to garage sales and pick up stuff and take it to the flea market and sell it for three times the amount, but we're lazy. We have a habit of being lazy. I'll work overtime, but I'm not going to work extra to make money on my own. I want somebody to give it to me. Hallelujah. Why are we where we're at? Because our habits have destroyed us. And our habits have robbed us of vision, dream, and aspirations. I've said it before, man, there is so much opportunity here locked up in every one of you. Every single one of you, there's opportunity locked up, and your habits are stopping it from happening. You're not cultivating a habit today to make something happen tomorrow. And you tell yourself, well, you know, it's going to take too long. I haven't found anything that takes too long. I don't plan on dying anyway anytime soon. So I don't plan on dying anytime soon. I may as well try to work for it. Scripture is presented to us like it's a magic mantra and we buy it. I'm not disavowing the power and the authority of quoting Scripture. I'm not saying that. It reinforces my strength in in God. It reinforces my confidence in God. But I'm not depending on the Scripture alone. I'm not going to walk around and say, but my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory and not go to work. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to have a, a, a need, and, 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 or I am going to have a need, rather, and be like Hezekiah, put my face to the wall, and put all my petitions before God. God, you see, I've been as faithful as I could be. I've done this and I've done that. Lord, I need you to touch my life right now. You said if I call upon you, that you would answer me. Relationship, not just the scripture. We have a habit of quoting scripture because that's what we've been told to do over and over again. It's not the saying, my friend, it's the doing. It's the doing. Isaiah chapter 1, starting starting at verse 19. Your habits kill your dreams and your destiny. Isaiah 1, 19. Let's read. If you are willing, and what? You see, we're all willing, but how obedient are you? Are you obedient enough to follow the gospel completely the way that he says? Or we justify it? Oh, they deserve what they got. You shall do what? Eat the good of the land. Here is the final analysis, Matthew chapter 7, of being obedient to the word. I used to think, you know, and I hear this all the time. How many ever heard, oh, it's so hard being a Christian? No, it's only hard being a Christian if you're sitting on the fence. Amen. When you make your decision, it becomes one of the easiest things to do. I've never had to resist drugs, alcohol, or anything else. I never had to resist it because I made my mind up. It wasn't even a question. You can't tempt me that way. You could tempt me with my attitude. Amen. You could tempt me with my anger. You can tempt me with my frustration. Those are the things I got to work on. Those will get me out of character. Those will get me out of line. But you can tempt me with that other stuff. 
I know the futility and the emptiness of that. But I had to learn the futility, the emptiness of giving in to my attitudes. And it was hard not to give in to my attitudes because it became a habit. When you, when, 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 when you stepped on my toes and you hurt me, I stepped on your toes and I hurt back instinctively without thinking about it. I reacted. How many reactors we got in here? Reacting always got me in trouble. Reacting means you're responding by your emotions or by your habit. The Bible says, be swift to speak. Huh? Slow to anger. What else? Slow to anger. Slow to hear. That implies think. Think before you respond. But how many of us react without thinking? See, we're not supposed to react, we're supposed to respond. There's a difference between the two. When I react, I'm meeting might with might, or might over might. When I respond, I've considered my actions. I've considered what I'm saying, and we could speak properly. Matthew 7, 24, this is, the re- this is the final analysis of being a doer. So everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them, obeying them, will be like a sensible, prudent, practical wise man who built his house upon the rock. And when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. So when the trials come, when the tribulations come, when the persecution comes, when the problems come, I didn't stop to pray then. I prayed before that so that when they come, I already had a habit of standing fast in the faith. Sad how many of us don't have a habit of doing anything to secure our future. A habit is anything that you do habitual. It could be so simple as driving home the same way. Or, you know, uh, I have a habit of watching the same kind of programs. Amen. My TV programming is very narrow. My wife says broad. 98% chick flicks. I consider that narrow, but she considers that broad. (laughs) But I cannot expand my TV programming because I have a habit of watching the same kind of programs because it does something to me. How many follow? War movies. Blow them up. Amen. Dismembered bodies. Whoa, did you see that? I did not expect that to happen. Let's rewind it. Uh Out of habit. And sometimes I'll have my grandchildren there. Without realizing they're there. Because out of habit, I'm watching this movie. Don't get me wrong, it, you know, they're violent movies. That's the movies I watch. I watch, ooh, pastor, so do you, so don't put me like that, man. I'm working on the same stuff you, you, you working on, man. You know, amen, you know. Christian movies just don't do that to me. They do something else to me. They do something else, right? But, man, you know, uh, I, I've never watched a Christian movie on the edge of my seat. <laughs> amen. But a violent movie, oh, my, what's going on? Oh, I can't believe they did that. I'm exposing myself. Amen. But a habit is something that you do habitually. Anything you do habitual becomes a habit. You make the same meal every day, that's a a habitual habit. And you did it without thinking. I sit down without thinking and turn the channel on, and I can tell within two seconds, three seconds, whether this is going to be my kind of movie or not. Right, because it captivated me. So I I did it by habit. I'm not thinking about anything. It's just habit. Habits are designed to be overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit. But you see, our habits to us aren't that important. And I'm praying that through this series, you understand how valuable your habits are. It's a multi-million dollar industry to tap into your habits, your buying habits, your browsing habits. Do you know what's for sale on the internet? Your browsing habits. Not you, 
because they get insight to who you are because of your habits. Romans chapter 7. Verse 15. The mighty apostle Paul was controlled by his habits. See, what we deal with is not, it's not, you're not so strange and so peculiar and so different that there's something wrong with you. We got the same problems Adam had. Well, not Adam. Oh, yeah, he had a wife. <laughs> From Adam to the Pope today, man. We all deal with the same things, yet we all feel so different. We all, nobody, under, man, we've all been through it. And survived. Amen. See, but you got to overcome it. Be more than a survivor. Be a thriver. Listen to the Apostle Paul said, the one that's preached, the one that wrote most of the New Testament. He said, I don't understand my own actions. Uh -uh. Have you ever done that? You know me, I do that all the time. I have no idea what I do, when I do it, and why I do it. It's nothing dangerous, it's just stupid stuff. Stupid stuff that I shouldn't be doing. Like eating the banana and putting the peel back perfectly like it looked like there was a banana there. I love that, that was my best one. <laughs> that was my best one. I have a friend of mine there was a chicken in the refrigerator and he went and he ate all the meat off the chicken without dissecting the chicken. All the bones were intact. And he put the bone, the, the meatless bone chicken back in the refrigerator. <laughs> and they asked him why he did that. He goes, I don't know. <laughs> How many of us here do things and don't know why? It's habit, which is honorary. It's just being honorary. Yeah, right. Amen. What I, what I, the last banana, why did, I, why did I make it look like there was a banana when it was the last banana there? Honorary, she's going to want this banana because she likes bananas and she's bananas. She's going to pick it up. Did I read no banana there? <laughs> honorary. Am I talking to anybody honorary in here? Habits that we need to break. If you talk to her today, she'll tell you I'm much, much better. This, this used to be a 24-7 thing with me. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> now it's about 27. <laughs> I do not understand my own actions. When I read this my first time, I go, my God, Paul did not understand his actions. I'm doing good. I'm baffled, bewildered. I do not practice or accomplish that which I wish. But the... I do the very thing that I loathe, which my moral instinct condemns. Listen to me. When I split open that banana, I'm eating the banana, and I get a thought. I don't know where the thought came from, but I get this thought. Close it up and make it look like it's real. There was something inside of me that's telling me, don't do that. Oh, but it's going to be funny. <laughs> but something inside of me says, don't do that. Anything that you ever wanted to do when you were doing it, in the process of doing it, you had to shut that conscious down. The Holy Spirit, your regenerated spirit, your born-again spirit was trying to tell you, don't do that, have a change of character, be a different person, but we're honorary. What is contrary to my desires, that means that I acknowledge and agree that the law is good, morally excellent, and that I take sides with it. But he said, the things I do habitually, anything you do habitually is a habit. And we need to understand, is it an acceptable habit? Or is it keeping you from God? Is it keeping you from something? If you continuously do it, well, let me put it this way, any habit that controls your mind, your emotions, and controls your action is not a positive habit. It will keep you from the blessings of God. You could sit around and you could tell yourself, I hear believers say this all the time, I'm a child of the living God. Amen, I'm sitting with him in the heavenly places. 
I have no fear for the Spirit of God is with me. That's a good thing to say. But what comes to mind when circumstances, opportunities, or trials come your way? That's your real habit. When you have a habit of giving in to fear, you're living with a fear habit. And that fear habit is dictating your lack of response to opportunities. That fear habit is dictating your lack of response to the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit puts a demand on you or brings an opportunity to you, that fear habit that you have not overcome, that you're still bound to because it controls your mind, the first thing you think of, it could be a financial opportunity to be blessed, it could be a financial opportunity to invest in something, and it's a good one, the Holy Spirit brought it to you, the first thing you think of is, can I afford to take a loss? Isn't loss fear? Loss is fear. And that's the first thing that comes to our mind because we have, we have established a habit of living in fear. We hear something screeching outside. We hear metal banging together. Oh my God, somebody hit my car. And how many of us go running out there? We don't go around to see if somebody's okay. We go around to see if somebody hit our car because we, felt, because we, have, we feel we're going to be in loss if somebody hit our car. Fear, Judges chapter 6, let's read this first. If you habitually succumb to fear, it will control your mind, manipulate your emotions, and keep you from faith. You don't have to live in fear. Just cultivate a habit of fear. That means, here's my habit of fear. Whenever an opportunity comes, the habit comes out. Opportunity comes to advance, the habit of fear comes out. A trial comes to place that is out of my control, the habit of fear comes out of me. Not the word of God, not being established in the faith. I start speaking doubt, I start speaking fear. Let's read Judges chapter 6. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of fearless courage. And Gideon said to him, O oh, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this befallen on us? Uh, where is all the wondrous works of which our forefathers, or which our fathers have told us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. What was passed down to him? Fear. Fear was passed down to him because he was hiding from the Midian threshing wheat. And here an angel of the Lord, one of the ultimate authority, came by and says, You're a mighty man of God. How many week after week after week, and some of you, year after year after year, I've been imparting to you that God wants you to prosper. God wants you to develop. God wants you to be well. God wants you to be spiritually well. He wants you to be emotionally well. And he wants you to be physically well. And you still don't believe it. The angel of the Lord said, you're a fearless man. But wait a minute. That's not what my forefathers said. All right, my ancestors said that God was great. We hear the preacher talk about how God used to be great. He took them out of Israel. He bought them out of bondage. He took the Jews back in 1948 and gave them a, a miraculous nation. He done something wonderful through them, through all the wars that they've been in. He kept them, so God is great. But he's not great enough to keep us through COVID. I can't help but keep going back to that because that's the mess we're in right now. And if there's nobody that understands your victory against that, I want the members of El Shaddai Ministries to understand you got the victory over it. Our forefathers told us the goodness of God. But listen, he said, no, go back, ready, go back one verse. The Lord has forsaken us and given us to the hand of the Midian. All of his ancestors deposited fear in him. He says, you can't be fearless because they're taking our wheat from us. God was great, but he didn't great no more. So they perpetuated the spirit of fear within him. 
and he lived in fear. Don't call me fearless. Amen. That, our time is gone. That's like, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. My name is Bitter. God was good to me at one time. God was good to me at one time. He was faithful. But now call me Bitter. Living in the bitterness of their souls. I'm not fearless. I'm a coward hiding in the cave because God's no longer with us. You see, fear, when we talk about fear, we think we're living in fear all the time. I'm afraid to go outside. I'm afraid to do this. I'm afraid. No. When you have habitual fear, it just waits for the time, right time to come out to hold you captive and bound from the promises of God. You could tell yourself, I'm a man of faith. I'm a man of confidence. I'm a man or woman. I'm a man or woman of assurance. But when an opportunity comes your way, you step back. Uh-oh. You don't jump out like Peter. The disciple sat back and said, uh-uh, man. This is not conducive to walking. Water is not solid. But Peter says, no, the Lord called me. The Lord called him out of that cave. God called you out of your bondage, and you're still waiting for something supernatural to happen before you can believe God. I'm going to tell you why. It's not just your fault. You were surrounded with fear as you were growing up. The generation before me didn't have a whole lot. So whatever monies they had, they held on to it. Amen. My mother could hold on to a dollar and just make it. I don't, it's incredible how she made that dollar work. But she was afraid to spend her money. How many follow what I'm talking about? Because of fear of not being able to get more. Because she knew for so long what it was like to be without. And whether we know it or not, that's still happening to some of y'all here. You're still carrying that same type of spirit. How many had that kind of family? I would always hear, gee, I would like to, I would like to. She had money, why don't you get it? No, oh, I don't want to spend my money. It's my confidence, it's my assurance. No, God is your confidence, God is your assurance. He got these opportunities for you. Now, when I listen to me, when I'm talking about opportunities, please understand this, I am not talking about multi-level marketing. <laughs> That's ghetto marketing, man, you know, getting rich off your friends. No, that ain't it, God got something better than that, right? God's got something better than that is you are carrying on the habits of your parents who carried on the habits of their parents. And not only that, but it's being fed through our media today. Fear is pandemic. Listen to this. I, I, I looked this up. It's pervasive, rather. Fear is pervasive. You know, we use words all the time. We, we know what they mean, but we're not really understand the totality of what it means. This is per, pervasive fear. Society understands how pervasive fear is, and so they sell it through our media, right? They sell it through the radio, they sell it through the airwaves, they sell it through the internet. And here's what per per pervasive means. Unwelcome influence spreading widely throughout an area or group of people. It's unwelcome influence. When I hear 3,000 people were infected with COVID today. Don't you come over my house. I don't want to be 3,001. Herd immunity. I'm not trying to be stupid about this. I pray all the time, God, give me wisdom, give me insight, give me understanding, because I know I could be a knucklehead sometimes. But I want to be right on this. The more I pray that, the more I'm assured. And when I'm listening to what they're saying and how they're changing things and how the media, mass hysteria, is promoting fear and people that I thought knew better would stand in the faith, but they're not. They're selling out for the four and a half million dollars. They're selling out, shutting their doors and keeping, I guarantee you, if these preachers were not getting any money coming in, their church doors would be open. The same way these governors and senators, if, they were, if their payroll was cut short, I bet you they would open us up so we can go back to work. I guarantee that. But this is how they're doing it. Fear of Ebola, fear of today, fear of tomorrow. 
fear of each other. That guy, so I just want to slap somebody sometimes. Amen. Because I'm, I'm walking in a store and I'm a happy-go-lucky guy. I don't look like a I am. Amen. And people back away from me because I got one foot too close to them. Now, I'm used to that before I was saved. <laughs> but I've been sanctified a long time, man. I know how to draw somebody. I know how to talk to somebody. I know how to welcome somebody. They don't even want to hear that. Get back. Six feet, six feet, six feet. <laughs> how many tired of hearing that? Yeah. Amen. Six feet. Fear for your kids. Fear, 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 fear. It's within us because it's a, we live it by habit of fear. Do you embrace opportunity when it comes your way? With something, I'm not saying don't investigate it and see if it's the right thing to do, but don't have fear about it. Don't, do not not take an opportunity because you have fear about it. Oh my God, this is all I have. I have $5,000 and if I invest this, I'll be broke. Then don't invest because you're investing for the wrong reasons. Invest because you investigated it and it looks like it's viable and it looks like it'll work and let it go and give it to God. Stop living in fear. When you have fear in your spirit, when you have fear in your life, well, first of all, the Bible says God didn't give us a spirit of fear. Power, love, and of a sound mind. But when we have that cultivated fear, when we have the habit of fear, it's just lying dormant, waiting to come out to put you back in your place. Yeah. Yeah. Do you hear that? Yeah. To put you back in your place where the government can control you, where the county can control you, where your husband can control you, your wife can control you, your children can control you, the devil can control you. Get out of the box, believe God, and step up and do what God called you to do. Come on, did you learn something? Amen. Come on, give him a praise.